to a safe place to learn with Alicia. In today's video, I'll be discussing chapter seven, the legislature and our textbook governing Texas. Chapter seven objectives include being able to describe the organization and basic rules of the legislature, outline the legislative and non-legislative powers of the legislature, trace the process through which law is made in Texas, analyze how party leadership and partisanship affects power in the legislature, and finally explain the politics of redistricting. The Texas legislature has grown more and more like the U.S. Congress as far as political polarization and partisan division goes. An unprecedented altercation occurred in 2017 on the Texas House floor after Republican Representative Rinaldi called immigration on a person in the viewing area that held up a sign saying, I'm illegal and I'm here to stay. Upon hearing this, Democratic Representative Navarez became irate and the two representatives engaged in a verbal altercation on the House floor. This shows how the Texas legislature has become less civil and more tense, especially with the introduction of deeply controversial bills. The Texas legislature reflects the state of Texas with conflicts rising in town squares, city parks, and workplaces. The Texas State Legislature is the most important representative institution in the state. Members share many duties and responsibilities like bringing the interests and concerns of their constituents into the democratic political process. The Texas Legislature is bicameral, meaning that it's composed of two chambers who meet in regular sessions 140 days out of every odd-numbered year. This allows bills to be voted on by two deliberative bodies representing different constituencies. Nebraska is the only state that isn't bicameral. There are 150 House of Representative members that serve two-year terms and 32 senators who serve four-year terms. Each House member represents roughly 168,000 people, while each senator represents roughly 811,000 people. Elections are held in November of even-numbered years, and senators and House members take office in January of odd-numbered years. One aspect of bicameralism in Texas is that the author of a bill in one house that gets amended in the other body has the option of accepting or rejecting the amendment. If the author accepts the amendment, the bill moves forward, and if the author rejects it, the bill is killed. One of the problems with this bicameral system is it allows a member of one body to retaliate against a member of either body for not cooperating on desired legislature. The regular session of the Texas legislature is a 140-day period, which occurs on a biennial schedule in odd-numbered years. The idea of biennial sessions originated in the 19th century. The idea was that the legislative service is a part-time job and short biennial sessions would limit the power of the legislature. Thousands of bills and resolutions are introduced during a regular session. For example, in 2017, over 6,600 bills are introduced and over 1,200 bills passed. Special sessions can be called by the governor to address unfinished business by the end of the regular session, or if problems requiring legislation arise between regular sessions. Texas has averaged one special session per year since 1876. The ability to call a special session and set its agenda provides the governor with control over which issues are discussed and what bills are passed. These sessions can last no more than 30 days, but a governor may call an unlimited number of sessions. In between sessions, legislators often serve on interim committees, give speeches, or provide constituent services. Questions have been raised about how using part-time legislators may not be what the state needs anymore due to the population growth. How can the legislature respond quickly and effectively to problems that arise in such a large and complex state? Each of the 150 House members and 31 Senate members represent a single-member district, a district in which one official is elected rather than multiple officials. The Constitution of 1876 set parameters for who could become a member of the legislature. In 1876, they believed that holding a public office required little to no formal training and should be open for most citizens. A senator must be a U.S. citizen at least 26, a qualified voter and a resident of the state for at least five years, as well as for, of the district for at least one year. Members of the House must be at least 21 years of age, 
U.S. citizens, qualified voters and residents of the state for at least two years, as well as of the district for one year. In Texas, the typical legislator is a white male, Protestant, college-educated, affluent, and has a professional or business occupation. About one-third of the members of the legislature are attorneys because it's one of the few careers that pays well and also offers flexibility. More minority office holders have been elected, and as the Latino population increases, more Latino legislators are likely to be elected. Women's role in politics has also increased since the 1970s. In 2019, there were 12 Democrats and 19 Republicans in the Texas Senate, and 67 Democrats and 83 Republicans in the Texas House of Representatives. Since legislative positions in Texas are meant to be part-time, legislators receive a salary of only $7,200 per year with a $190 per per day stipend when the legislature is in session and can also claim 12 to 16 days per month of per diem in addition to receiving a generous pension with at least eight years of service. A legislator who has served over 10 years would qualify for a pension of $32,000 per year starting at age 50. The Texas legislature sets public policy by passing bills supervising the state bureaucracy and the termination of state agencies. Supervision comes in the form of passing bills and resolutions and functions falling outside of the lawmaking process. Bills are proposed laws that have been sponsored by a member of the legislature and submitted to the clerk of the House or Senate. Revenue bills must start in the House. All other bills may start in either chamber. It used to be that a bill would be introduced in either the House or the Senate and work its way through the legislative process in that chamber before being considered by the other one, but now a bill is typically introduced in the House and the same bill called a companion bill in the Senate at the same time, saving time in the long run. There are three classifications of bills in the Texas legislature, local bills, special bills, and general bills. Local bills affect only units of local government, such as a city, a county, special districts, or more than one city in a county. Special bills give individuals or corporations an exemption from state law, but are less common than local bills and are prohibited for most purposes in Texas because it can promote legal challenges. General bills apply to all people and or property in the state. These bills define criminal behavior, establish standards for divorce, uh, child custody or bankruptcy, and address other matters affecting people and property throughout the state. There are three types of resolutions, an expression of an opinion on an issue by a legislative body. Concurrent resolutions involve issues of interest to both chambers and must pass both the House and the Senate before requiring the governor's approval. Joint resolutions typically propose amendments to the Texas Constitution or ratify an amendment to the U.S. Constitution and must pass each chamber but don't require the governor's approval. A proposed amendment of the Texas Constitution requires a two-thirds vote of both houses. Ratification of amendments of the U.S. Constitution requires a majority vote in both the Texas House and Senate. Simple resolutions concern only the House or Senate and do not require the governor's approval. Simple resolutions are used to adopt rules, to request opinions from the Attorney General, to appoint employees to office in the House or Senate, or to honor outstanding achievements by Texas residents. Non-legislative powers include the power to serve constituents, electoral powers, investigative powers, directive and supervisory powers, and judicial powers. The passage of legislature may be may be necessary to exercise these powers. Electoral powers are the legislature's mandated role in counting returns in the election for governor and lieutenant governor during a joint session or the legislature when it's organized for a regular session. Investigative powers are powers exercised by the House, the Senate, or both chambers jointly to investigate problems facing the state. A special investigative committee is created by a simple resolution, creating the committee, establishing its jurisdiction, and explaining the need for an investigation. 
If the special committee is formed in the House, the Speaker appoints the members of the committee. The Lieutenant Governor appoints members for the special committees in the Senate. The Speaker and the Lieutenant Governor share appointment powers for a joint investigation. Directive and supervisory powers are the legislature's power over the executive branch, which are typically shown with budgetary power. Through the passage of the state budget, the legislature determines the size of the appropriation each state agency has to spend for the next two years. The amount of money an agency has determines how well it can carry out its goals and objectives. A review of each agency of state government takes place every 12 years. Judicial powers include the power to impeach members of the executive or judicial branch, a majority vote of the House is required to bring charges, and a two-thirds vote of the senators attending is necessary to convict. The Texas Constitution does not explicitly define what constitutes as an impeachable offense, so that's decided by the legislature during the impeachment process. Impeachment is rare in Texas, with only two occurring in the 1900s. Governor Jim Ferguson was impeached in 1917, and a state judge was impeached in 1975. For a bill that starts in the House, there are basically six steps, introduction, referral, consideration by standing committee, and floor action. Then step one through four repeated in the Senate, then action by a conference committee and approval by both houses, and then the final step is action by the governor. A bill can be written by anyone but must be introduced by a member of the legislature. During step one, the introduction in the House or Senate, a member of the legislature files a copy of the bill with the clerk of the House or the secretary of the Senate. The clerk or secretary numbers the bill and enrolls it by recording its number, title, caption, and sponsor in a ledger, and similar information is then entered into a computer. After enrollment, the bill is read for the first time by its number, title, and caption. The mail the bill must be read on two more separate occasions. The next step is referral. The bill is sent for consideration by standing committee by either the Speaker of the House or the Lieutenant Governor after being read for the first time. The standing committee is permanent and has the power to propose and write legislation that covers a particular subject. The committee to which a bill is assigned can determine whether the bill survives or dies in committee. The standing committee may then make changes to the bill, combine it with other bills, or kill it by not passing it out of committee or by pigeonholing. This means that the committee chair sets it aside indefinitely rather than bringing it to the committee. Most bills die in committee and the ones that don't are likely amended. In the House, hearings can take place that allow experts and the public to educate the committee members on the good and bad aspects of the bill. In the Senate, all bills reported by committees must have a public hearing. In the House, bills referred by a standing committee go next to the Calendars Committee, which after consulting with the Speaker, schedules the bill for debate. In the Senate, bills are debated in the order they leave the committee. The Senate can override this order with a two-thirds vote. Debate in the Senate is unlimited, which means it's possible for a senator to filibuster. A filibuster occurs when a senator talks for a lengthy period of time in an effort to kill a bill or to obtain amendments or other compromises. There's no eating or drinking during a filibuster. Senators must stand at their desk and may not lean, sit, or use their desk or chair in any way. All remarks must be confined to the issue under consideration and spoken in an audible voice. Since World War II, there have been more than 100 filibusters. The longest was in 1977 by Senator Bill Mayer, who spoke for 43 hours. In 2013, Senator Wendy Davis became famous nationwide for her nearly 24-hour filibuster against a bill requiring sonograms for women who wanted abortions. Members of both the House and the Senate may use chubbing, where one or more members debate bills at length to slow the process and delay a vote. On important issues, the Senate can suspend the rule of regular order of business and speed the bill along. In the past, you needed two-thirds of the Senate to agree in order to for a bill to proceed. In 2015, this was changed to a simple majority, speeding legislation to the Senate floor. 
Recently, this has meant that the Democrats or the minority party could easily block legislation that they didn't approve of. Bills must pass both chambers in the same form. If they're different than the conference committee compromises on the parts of the bill that are not the same, each chamber then debates on the revised bill and chooses to pass or reject it. Conference committees have 10 members, five members from the House appointed by the Speaker, and five members, which must include two members of the standing committee that considered the bill, and from the Senate appointed by the Lieutenant Governor. If the bill is accepted in both chambers, then a final copy of the bill is prepared and then signed by the Speaker of the House, the Clerk of the House, and the President of the Senate, also known as the Lieutenant Governor, and the Secretary of the Senate. The signed bill is then sent over to the governor where the governor can either sign or veto the bill. During the first 130 days of a regular session, the governor has 10 days from the time the bill arrives on his or her desk to sign or veto the legislation. If the governor neither signs nor vetoes the bill in the 10 days, it becomes law. In the last 10 days of session, the governor has 20 days from the time the bill arrives on their desk to either sign or veto the legislation, and if the governor doesn't, it becomes law. A veto from the governor can be overridden with two-thirds vote from both the House and the Senate. When the governor vetoes a bill, they attach a message explaining why and returns it to the chamber that originated the bill. If the presiding officer chooses to allow a vote to override the veto, a vote is scheduled. Veto overrides aren't common. In the last 70 years, only two vetoes have been overridden. At the end of the session, between day 131 and 140, if the governor wants to veto a bill, they simply wait to do so until the legislature has adjourned, since by then the veto cannot be overridden. This is called a post-adjournment veto or a strong veto. The governor also has a special line item veto for specific items from the state's omnibus appropriations bill, which allows him to sign the bill but mark through specific items. The governor can also influence legislation through message power or the ability to communicate with the legislature. One of the ways that they communicate is through the state address, where the governor describes their vision for the state and submits an executive budget along with the letter explaining why the state should adopt this new budget. Another way the governor communicates with the legislature is through personal visits or using members of their staff to visit the legislators. The governor's representatives act as lobbyists, but since the Texas Constitution prohibits the use of tax dollars to influence the legislature, they claim that they're just providing necessary information to the legislators. There are many additional players in the legislative process aside from the governor, House, and Senate. One of these players is the Comptroller of Public Accounts, who informs the legislature of revenue estimates for biannual spending. The Texas Constitution forbids borrowing money to conduct the daily operations of government, so the budget's very important. The estimate provided by the comptroller sets the limit on state spending. If the legislature wants to spend more than the comptroller estimates, it must increase taxes and fees to cover the additional cost. The comptroller can be politically motivated, providing a low revenue estimate and then telling the legislature that the estimates will remain low until it passes bills the comptroller wants, and only then will the comptroller revise the estimates to increase the spending limit and allow the legislature to complete its business. The media can also influence the public by focusing on particular issues while legislators use the media to communicate their messages. The more the media covers a particular topic, the more likelihood there is of issues moving towards the top of the legislative agenda. The ability to rule acts of the legislature and actions of the state agencies unconstitutional gives courts a lot of power over the issues the legislature addresses. Lobbyists and interest groups also influence legislators. During a regular session, roughly 1,800 people register as lobbyists. A lobbyist's job is to convince legislators to support the interests the lobbyist represents. Interest groups are actively involved in supporting legislation as well as stopping legislation they do not support. The public also influences legislators. People use the right to vote, right to petition, and the right to free speech to signal their support of legislators and policies. The public may also influence politicians to change their election tactics. 
The House and Senate play a big role in structuring the committees of the legislature, setting the state's political agenda, and passing or defeating bills. Leadership within the legislature includes the Speaker of the House and the Lieutenant Governor. The Speaker is the presiding officer of the Texas House of Representatives and leads both the party and the House, influences the legislative agenda, individual pieces of legislation, and committee assignments. The Speaker is elected by the members of the House at the beginning of the regular legislative session and holds a huge amount of power, including the power to influence House members' positions and the fate of legislation. The Lieutenant Governor serves as the President of the Senate and has control over committee appointments, influences the legislative agenda, and is the second highest elected statewide official who is elected for a four-year term. The lieutenant governor is not a member of the Senate and may only vote to break a tie. They also have the power to decide all questions of order on the Senate floor, subject to appeal from members, recognize members on the floor, refer bills to committees, and appoint members to standing committees, subcommittees, special committees, and conference committees. The organization of the Texas legislature is not strictly along party lines, leading to less partisanship in the legislative body. Leadership and power have become more centralized in the speaker and the lieutenant governor. They can make committee appointments with limited regard for party affiliation, making sure members will be loyal to them rather than to the party. Each chamber votes on rules granting or restricting the powers of the speaker or the lieutenant governor at the beginning of the legislative session, potentially leading to more partisanship if members of different parties lead each chamber. The power of recognition gives the speaker and the lieutenant governor the power to control floor debate by recognizing who can speak before the House and the Senate. In the House, the Speaker controls who speaks and how long the debate will last. The Speaker can ignore or skip a member seeking recognition to speak, which is a sign that they've fallen from the Speaker's good graces, and to structure the debate by picking and choosing who speaks to affect the outcome of the legislation. The Senate rule allowing unlimited debate decreases the Lieutenant Governor's power, but they usually control one-third of the votes due to the large amount of power they are given on issues important to them. One of the most influential powers of the Speaker and Lieutenant Governor have is the ability to assign members to standing committees and appointing the chair of those committees. The power can be used to appoint individuals supportive of the leader's agenda, which leads to influencing legislation. At the beginning of every legislative session, members of the House are asked to turn in a list of committees they'd be interested in serving on. The Speaker then assigns committee memberships, considering seniority, leadership, skills, and interest in particular issues. The most important factor in committee assignment is the member's relationship with the presiding officer. Committees in the Texas legislature also have overlapping jurisdiction. Although each bill must be assigned to a committee, there's more than one committee to which it can be assigned. Leadership use the bill assignment power to influence the bill's outcome, assigning bills they oppose to committees they believe don't like the bill, and sending those they support to committees they believe will favor the bill. It's harder to identify common ground and produce a policy consensus as partisan polarization has significantly increased in recent decades. Redistricting is the process of redrawing election districts and redistributing legislative representatives in the Texas House, Texas Senate, and U.S. House. It generally occurs every 10 years after the census to reflect shifts in population or to respond to legal challenges in existing districts. The population has a huge effect on who wins the seats in that district. Each of the newly drawn districts for the Texas legislature must now contain an almost equal number of people. That that requirement guarantees that each person's vote counts the same no matter where they're voting. The U.S. Supreme Court's decision in Baker v. Carr in 1962 and Reynolds v. Sims in 1964 compelled the legislature to draw new districts where boundaries were drawn that represented the population fairly, leading to the one-person, one-vote principle, which requires each district to be roughly equal in population. Eventually, Evenwell v. Abbott challenged this, but the Supreme Court disagreed, saying that the principle is consistent with the Constitution. 
Once the U.S. Census prescribes how many seats each state is entitled to in the U.S. House of Representatives, the Texas legislature divides Texas into the appropriate number of congressional districts. According to the 1964 Supreme Court case Westbury v. Sanders, each state's U.S. House districts must be roughly equal to the population. Depending on how the districts are drawn, the representation of the two political parties in the U.S. House can be significantly changed. If the legislature fails to redistrict at the first regular session after the census, the Legislative Redistricting Board completes the redistricting. This board includes the Lieutenant Governor, Speaker of the House, Attorney General, Commissioner of the General Land Office, and the Comptroller of Public Accounts. The LRB must meet within 90 days of legislative adjournment and complete its responsibilities within another 60 days. The redistricting plans must comply with the Federal Voting Rights Act. When Republicans took control of both the Texas House and the Senate in 2002, they took measures to ensure the Republican majority in Texas U.S. House delegation. Their mid-cycle redistricting was unconventional and resulted in Democratic walkouts in both the House and the Senate, and in a lawsuit challenging the constitutionality of the new districts. The courts decided in Shelby County v. Holder in 2013 that the requirements that Texas had to have its new district lines approved by the DOJ wasn't necessary and and eliminated it, but courts will probably revisit redrawing district lines to ensure compliance with federal laws. In this chapter, we've explored the legislature in Texas. Texas legislature meet only once every two years, is part-time, and receives very limited compensation for its members. The structure of the legislature has been the same since the 1876 Constitution, but that may change soon. The 1876 Constitution reflected the distrust of a powerful governor, resulting in the Texas governor sharing political influence with two others, whom the governor has no formal control over, the speaker and the lieutenant governor. The Texas legislature has become more like the U.S. legislature, with increasing political polarization and partisan division. A Tea Party speaker would bring a more conservative direction to the House, as well as eliminating the little bipartisanship that remains. The end of the two-thirds rule in the Texas Senate also brings a new era of partisanship. The rule required members of both parties to work together to pass legislation, and now that only a majority is needed, partisanship will likely increase. So that was it for this chapter. Let's review the objectives really quick. So for describing the organization and basic rules of the legislature, the Texas legislature is bicameral. The leader of the Texas House is the speaker and the lieutenant governor presides over the Texas Senate. Although the typical member of the legislature is a white male, women and minorities have increased their representation in recent years. Representatives use social media and other forms of communication to stay in touch with the people in their districts. Next, outline the legislative and non-legislative powers of the legislature. The Texas legislature passes bills and resolutions and supervises the state bureaucracy through the budgetary process and sunset legislation. Next, trace the process through which law is made in Texas. The process of how a bill becomes a law is similar to that at the federal level. A key difference is the governor's use of the line item veto by which the governor can eliminate individual appropriations or line items in the state budget. Additionally, the lieutenant governor and the speaker of the Texas House have exceptionally strong powers. The committee system plays a major role in shaping the legislative process. Analyze how party leadership and partisanship affect power in the legislature. The speaker of the House and the lieutenant governor are the most important actors in the legislature. Together, they help to centralize power in the legislature and they and they facilitate or prevent the passage of legislation. This legislature has become increasingly partisan. Explain the politics of redistricting. One of the most partisan activities of the legislature invo involves redrawing of district lines for the Texas House of Representatives in the Texas Senate. 
New districts must be drawn at least every 10 years to reflect changes in the population of the state. This process of redistricting provides opportunities for the dominant political party to create districts for their partisan advantage. While there are some legal and constitutional restrictions to redistricting, generally as long as the district reflects equal populations and racial or ethnic minorities are not disadvantaged, legislators have great freedom in drawing the district boundaries. So that's all for this chapter. Thank you so much for joining me today. I really hope you learned something new. Um, And as always, please remember to like and subscribe. Have a great day.